It's another evening of Museum in Lotus. We are back here again with Mr. Giuseppe De Giosa. Uh, we know this whole series, uh, we are talking about artifacts owned by Master Yun. Not for sale, because what we only sell are things that are feng shui related and things that are first hand. But through these amazing collections, we can understand Master Yun and his world of feng shui universe way better. Am I right, Mr. Pino? I think absolutely uh, right. It's through these antiques and the value of these antiques and the detail of these antiques that we can actually transit uh, to Master Yun's art and appreciate the finer details. That's the reason of the Museum in, in Lotus. And you will see tonight extremely detailed, beautiful items uh, which actually recall the same beauty, the same essence uh, in Master Yun's uh, paintings. Then come to think of it, actually, um, Master Yun's art, uh, really, or, or the way he presents his art, the exhibitions and the collaborations and so on, really transcends uh, many different boundaries that we might be conflicting ourselves with, for instance, nationality, culture, time, and so on. Uh, we know that Master Yun has many collaborations with different industries, with uh, people of different culture back cultural backgrounds, nationalities and so on. And what we are doing here, not just across of uh, cultural industries, but also time, because we're talking about antiques. And uh, what do these antiques have in similar to uh, Master Yin's art? That is really the question. Uh, so if you are here with us, uh, please like and share, because uh, we are continuing certain topics uh, in the 45th episode, and to tell you from a different perspective on how you can better enter into Master Yin's art universe. Today we're going to talk about something quite um, unique and special. Very unique, very special. Yeah, uh, the, the theme, the theme, and the idea. It's uh, it's really about. I see Amanda here. I see Laura, uh, Gillian, Madam Lai, Stephen Le, and so on. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Uh, like and share, and tell your friends to actually grab a, uh, a watch on this episode because we're going to ask you how do you actually sleep at night, uh, or what do you bring into your dreams. Uh, Mr. Pino, do you dream? In like when you sleep, do you dream? Yeah. Very much. Very, very much. Very yeah. much I do dream, and those dreams come alive in the morning. Usually, it didn't happen before, but I can see in the last maybe year or so, I'm placed back in periods uh, which I've left uh, behind, mostly to do with uh, my previous work in the bank in the head office, uh, with a lot of tension that used to come from that. And I'm liberated in the morning, let me tell you. But I do, during the course of the day, recollect uh, what exactly the tension were all about uh, and what were the discussion. So I'm very lucky. I don't need to go back to that, but in my dreams, yes. So you're saying that when you fall asleep, yes, you dreamed about the banking days. Absolutely. When they come back to you, yeah. when I go to to bed, I can immediately I can immediately sleep. But I know for sure because of the recollection the day after that I have been dreaming something specific, which I'm actually quite able to reconstruct. I may not be able to reconstruct the details, but the situation, the anxiety, the pressure that used to come with. Uh, the the job I had. This is strange, huh? It uh, is strange. Of so many things in uh, in the, the whole of your life, uh, the thing that came to your mind when you fell asleep was the banking days. So it must have occupied a significant place in your in your life then. Well, if you consider I worked for forty years uh, with the same organization, uh, and uh, there were recurrent episodes. Uh, and maybe this recurrent episodes are the reason why they're coming back uh, into my dreams. Uh, and again, it's all about uh, discipline. It's all about responsibilities. It's all about uh, making sure that whatever I was requested to do, I did it, uh, I did it to the best uh, of my ability. Right. Um, for those of us who are actually watching, uh, I want to ask that... Uh, if you remember and if you recollect your dreams and what you dream about, uh, please tell us what was the last thing you dream about. Because I think that the, the common concept that uh, uh, we, you know, now we are awake, right? 
uh, most of the people, they might sleep about five to eight hours in a day. Yes. And uh, that's actually one third of your day. Uh, what you actually do during your sleep is actually very important. We never know, we never talked about that before. We just think that, okay, maybe when we sleep, it's actually part of uh, the resting process and all this stuff. But we really look across all different cultures and uh, history and different communities before they go to sleep and when they wake up, there are different things that they do to ensure that at least that you have a good sleep and probably what you bring into your sleep might be very important as well. So who, if you are watching this, if you have been having dreams, you can share with us the dream. Some people, some people, they sleep super soundly. They fall asleep, they wake up. Whoa. Some people, when they wake up, they'll remember what they dream about. And actually, it will sort of like be with them for a very long while throughout the entire day. Am I right? Yeah. Do you dream? I dream. I dream. The thing is that I am a super light sleeper. So sometimes I cannot differentiate that was it real or was it... <laughs> <laughs> I might just wake up in the middle of the night, but I, I do dream. Yeah. And is sometimes, that a recurring dream? Okay, not just recurring dream, but sometimes it's so uh, funny that it feels as if it's a, it's a serial drama. Like, I think I dreamt about this a couple of days ago. <laughs> and now the story is continuing. <laughs> sometimes. But if you ask me when I wake up, do I remember or can I provide the exact details of uh, what I dream about? I can't. Uh, maybe I can't. Maybe I can't. Uh, but, you know, what the, the condition of your sleep does affect the next day when you are, what we say, when you're awake, right? Absolutely, so, yes. Uh, uh, okay, Mr. Pino, you are a Catholic. Yes, I am. Am I right? Am I right that uh, Catholics actually they pray before they sleep and when they are awake? Okay, once my, they are awake, sorry. Yeah. Uh, my my habit uh, is in the morning when I get up, uh, I do thank uh, our Heavenly Father for the life that I've, I've been given, the fact uh, that I can experience a new day. At the same time, when I'm about to have whatever meal, that is the breakfast or is lunch or is dinner, I'd just like to share a few words of thanks, first of all, not only to the Heavenly Father, because that is the food that actually nurtures us and consents us to go ahead and live, but at the same time, the hands of the person who has prepared that food. Very simple, few words, but the respect which, when I was young, I did not have. And I suppose getting more mature and really appreciating the simple things makes you think and makes you more aware of all the... There are people out there, they can't have a bowl of rice. And we instead not only can have it, but have a shelter, we have a home, we, we have some time wine, so we can indulge. And for this, I'm very, very gra grateful and in many ways also privileged. Right. So that is, uh, that is before a meal. Yes. And uh, before you sleep, do you do it? No. I don't. I don't. But when you uh, wake up? When I wake up. When you wake up, you yes. do it? Yes. Yes. Why, why do you do it when you wake up? Because as I just mentioned, uh, is thanking God for having gone through the night for allowing me to start the day and I think also the energies and the determination and the willingness to, to, to basically start a new day right. and, uh, and, not, and not being sick. And was this done uh, at the moment when you wake up or do you brush your teeth first or no, what? No, it would be the first thing actually that I, I would do unless I need to go to the washroom sometimes after my shower, but before having the breakfast, I would just address uh, and, uh, and thank God for the, the things that I've mentioned uh, I'm blessed with. So pretty much the first part the when first you wake part, up. The, yes. Quite the immediate first part uh, once uh, they wake up, once Mr. Pino wakes up. Uh, you know, they always say, people always say, or there have been sayings that uh, the, the, the Chinese population or the Chinese culture Yes. It's, it's one that is uh, sort of without a religion. Right. Not much, you know, if you don't really consider uh, Taoism as a very tight religion or Confucian as a way of life and philosophy, uh, there isn't really one god per se that actually they refer to. Uh, but what you mentioned about prayers in the morning and, you know, some of the cultures and religions, they will have prayers before they go to sleep. Some of the Catholics, they practice that as well. 
but we do find that what the Chinese do before they go to sleep and right after they wake up to be quite uh, mystical or to be quite uh, interesting as well. Because uh, today we're really going to talk about how you go to sleep and what we're going to bring into your sleep. So right in front of us, this pair of uh, a bit chunky uh, artifacts, uh, it's actually a great testament to what's going on. And you come to think of it, you find that it's actually quite funny that why did the ancient Chinese do something like this. It's something that actually, you know, today in our world, we don't do something like that anymore. We just find that, ah, that's not a necessity. But why did they do it? Yes, they might have all the money in the world, but why did they do it? They could have gotten a better mattress or something. <laughs> I think it was twofold. Uh, and this is my interpretation. I'm not a Chinese. First of all is the sense of beauty. It's going to bed and associating uh, that calmness uh, again with beauty and uh, knowing that you are in some way protected. And as we will describe tonight, uh, there's two pieces uh, in front of us and then we will show you two more. We will see also what these two pieces represent and uh, what was the use. Represent right. in terms of uh, the carving that you see, the decoration, and what was the specific use uh, of these two pieces? Uh, Shall we talk about these two pieces first? Absolutely. Right in front of us, yeah. Absolutely. Let me just lift it a little bit okay. uh, so that we can have... Uh, oh, heavy. They're very heavy. Now, you imagine that these are two solid blocks uh, of hardwood. And let me tell you, I think it would be around seven to eight centimeters uh, thick, the wood. So we are talking about the thickness of uh, the wood. here, that is about seven to eight centimeters, if you can see it. The maximum point would be seven to eight centimeters. Yeah, here, this part here, yeah. Yes, yes. Now, when we look at the carving, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind uh, is basically this two lateral elements, uh, figures, if you wish. Looking carefully, those are elephants. Uh, and if you see the elephants are, are carved majestically, I would say. Let me use this adverb, majestically. First of all, uh, we can see the face, we can see the trunk, we can see the task. And let me point out that when you look at the task, you actually have the folding of the skin. Yeah, we're talking about this part here. Yes. Right? Yes. And actually, it's, uh, it happens on the other piece as well. Yes. So we have sort of like two elephants going on. Two elephants going on. But they, are not, they don't match like this, am I right? They, 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 they go separately. They go separately. Okay, okay. But if you see, they are almost identical. Not, Very much. Not 100% identical. There are differences. And of course, if you consider, if the carver had carved one, it would have been very easy for him to carve the second one exactly the same. It wasn't the case. I mean, artifacts express uh, different feel and different uh, capabilities uh, of the artisan. Now, look at the overall color. This is a sort of reddish maroon color. And this is lacquer. On top of this lacquer, there was gilding. Yes. Which bring me, brings me to mind, uh, wow. These people had the money not only to order a piece of this quality, two pieces of this quality, they gilded them on top. What else do we see? In each of these, let's call uh, wood blocks, uh, we would see the representation of four figures. Oh. And when we look at the four figures, two are very distinct, very easy to spot. The other two are less distinct. But when we look at the two main figures, uh, first of all, we see two tables uh, or 
tables at the base. Right. Underneath, there are scrolls which tells me that they're possibly literary, literary family. At the same time, what we see, we see the lotus uh, motif. Uh, and uh, on two bridges uh, at the different levels, uh, we see some amazing figures uh, riding horses. Look at the face of the horses. Uh, they're looking uh, at each other. Right. The, the definition of the horses uh, is just amazing. Amazing. When we look at the riders, uh, they are definitely in a very high position. And to me, they look like soldiers. Uh, they could be generals uh, on these uh, horses. Uh, they are in armor. They have uh, spears. They have uh, other kinds of armaments of those days. And we see next to them almost like an attendant. This is on foot. And on the other side, we see another attendant with a long, a long flag on, on top, on one of, the, on one of the two. Second is, I said, very similar, not identical. So the two main figures on top of the horses are there. Look at the face um, feature, very different. Uh, look at the dresses, uh, apparel, also different. Look at the two attendants. Uh, one is, again, on foot and uh, is holding a, sp a spear. The other one seems to be up on the mountain and possibly is not even an attendant is somebody watching this scene of combat. This is what it is. Right. So the details are amazing. The color, the lacquer is amazing. And of course, the gold gilding as well. There is no doubt that it would take a family wealthy enough to carve something like this. And uh, as you mentioned, 7 to 8 cm of thickness of hardwood. I tell you, this is extreme. I would say it's extremely, but it's heavier than what, is, what it seems. Um, it's heavier than what it seems. You're absolutely correct. Eh? So, 19th century? Night, I was going to ask that, like, what's the age? 19th century, 1800 19th century. plus, so 200 we're over years old. We're talking about Qing dynasty, right. definitely. Now, the question that initially I asked myself when uh, I looked at these two pieces uh, in the collection of Master Yun, and of course I'm not Chinese, and I started to ask myself, what could these two pieces uh, be used for? Well, that was the uh, exact question I'm going to ask you. <laughs> I mean, one thing is certain, because of, cer of certain elements. Uh, right. Do you see here, there's a sort of an opening, uh, and that opening uh, brings me to mind uh, what it was possibly, and also there's this wood here, it's natural wood. It's not been... Uh, this part has not been carved, yeah, the top it's part. It's not yeah. been carved, it's and part, at yeah. the same time, it's not been lacquered. Right. So why was this not lacquered, and why on the side we have this uh, sort of hollow segment? The, the answer, it's not too difficult. The answer is that these were part of a much larger structure, and... The way it's been carved tells me that the technique that was used to assemble this part with the rest was what we have many times mentioned. I will just say, tell you is the mortise and tenon technique. Just a brief reminder, no glue, no screws, nothing. And that's to allow the wood to basically flex during different period of the year and provide a solidity that, let me tell you, is just incredible. Incredible. Which means that what you're saying is that, okay, so the, the Qing Dynasty chairs that we're sitting on, we know they are created by the multi-tenant technique, the Lego yes. technique sometimes, and turning. 
uh, this piece over here yes. is actually one piece of such Lego. Yes. Am I right? <laughs> so you're looking at the raw, you're looking at a segment of a Lego here. <laughs> because we see, if you can see that the gaps here, you can see there are there's a holes here, it seems that they're about to join something. Yes. But we don't see the whole structure. We so can't it's a segment see the whole structure. It. Am I right? So uh, the, the question is now, okay? So this thing, this, oh my god, yeah, this whole, this, this, this set, yeah. It's uh, supposed to be a, a Lego, a part of a Lego set. Yes. So the question is that, when it's joined yes. into a full, <laughs> completed Lego, perhaps, Yes. what is it supposed to be? Okay, when we look at the thickness uh, and uh, we consider the structure, to me, this was a base. This is the bottom part. This is, this is the bottom. At the, at the end. Would you agree with this? Well, I mean, the, if it's so heavy, and uh, I don't think logically Chinese would put an elephant on in the air. Yes. So they are supposed to symbolize something that is at the, at the bottom to support strength and all this thing. So I would suppose that, yeah, yeah, this is at the base. And also, I mean, I will look at this. This is just a very technical thing that here is totally flat. It's yes. Def, it's, maybe there's nothing beyond this. Yes. But here, there are a lot of gaps and holes and seems that yes. something can be slotted here. Yes. So something should have existed above this thing. Correct. Like this, and it goes up, goes up like this. Yes. Am I yes. right? Yeah. Absolutely right. And there are some feature which I have not touched uh, is the Rui feature, which again has a very auspicious uh, connotation. So. What would this be used for? I have come to the conclusion, I don't think I'm far away from the reality, and we will show you a, a picture. This was the base of a canopy bed, very large canopy bed, extremely rich family who could afford to get an overall bed with the level of carving that I personally have not seen. When you look at each of the image, it's at least, it's in relief. So all the contour have been taken out of the wood and it's actually now protruding for at least two centimeters, at yes. least two centimeters. Now imagine the ability, the skill that the artisan had in order to make something like this. Now, if you'd like to imagine with me the possible bed that this was part of, this is exactly it. Oh, okay, so let's take a look. This is exactly, so this is what you're telling us. Uh, this is how a, what you mentioned, canopy bed. Did you mention that? This is canopy how a bed. Canopy bed might look. Uh, it can be this, it can be uh, something else uh, like, uh, let's see. Uh, something like that as well. This is more elaborated, yeah? Yes. It's a canopy bed. So this Lego segment that we see here, yes, is actually sort of like the base of the, the whole thing. Perfectly right. The base of the whole thing. That part, probably yes. that part, something like that. Now let me, let me just point out, if I may, look at the quality. This is definitely a museum piece. Uh, the one that we see the overall. And this unfortunately does not have the rest. But when you look at the carving of what I suspect is a museum piece, and this carving, this carving is a much, much better carving. So it stands to be on its own. It's definitely not a piece of art, but it's a fantastic piece. When we actually talk about art, then we have to get into the realm of Master Yun Feng Shui. That is real art. Right, so this is part of the bed, and um, we see the whole bed just now. Yes. And before we get deeper into this thing and uh, why they are so elaborated, actually we do have uh, another set here. Yes. That is another part of the bed. It's another part of the bed. We don't have the full thing, but uh, we have another part of the, the, the whole thing that yes. uh, if we have all the pieces together, we might just have a huge bed around us. 
Yes. But uh, shall we take a look at this, uh, this thing as well? And I guarantee well? this is neither a mattress, neither is a pillow, what we're going to show you now. All right, we just let this lie down for a while. Yes. In fact, actually, uh, you know, we should exchange positions. Uh, this should be on my side. No, okay. this should be on my side. Uh, yes. And this should be on your side. Yes. As we allow them to imagine uh, what's going on with the debate. So, um, am I right? Yes. It's not from the same bed, I understand. Definitely it's but, not. But uh, we can have some imagination of what's going on. Correct. Right. These are panels. The panels. I would say oh these God. are two and, a half, two and a half uh, centimeters thick, as you can possibly see from the side. Again, extremely ornate. And they would be part of, again, a canopy, a canopy bed. Dating uh, would be approximately the same would be Qing period, 19th century. What I see here, it, it's a pair, slightly different, uh, so their own personality. It has a sort of uh, maroon color, which brings me to say this is definitely not the same one. The same of uh, the feet that we have just seen. This belongs to a totally different uh, canopy bed. Equally interesting, equally rich, possibly for high official, if not an aristocratic uh, Qing dynasty family. Now, what do we see here? This would possibly have been placed on, uh, along the front part uh, of the bed. Can we take a look at the, uh, on a sample of the full bed again? Okay, so we are talking about, let's say the top left, top right, or the left yes. or the right, you know? Yes. The whole thing. So the base would be at the bottom left, bottom right. Correct. And we have this. So we are actually sort of like missing a piece here and there. And it attaches to the left and right. So let's get back to us on this thing. So this, we have this here, uh, the base. Yes. Uh, you can imagine it's all the way down there. And this piece might be about here. Yes. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, it might be about Level here. There. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So there's something Correct. in between. Uh, we're not talking about the same bed. It's not. But these are definitely things that the ancient Chinese see before they go to bed and after they wake up. Absolutely, yes. Totally uh, royal colors, maroon red, yes. bright red. And the other similarity about these two, even they are not from the same set, is that they're all gold gilded. Not only they're gold gilded, I, I think in terms of quality carving, uh, they're not very distant one from the other. So definitely comes from what I call an atelier where they used to make the best of the best in the in the in what they used to produce, and I think they were specialized in canopy beds. And uh, again, maroon color. Look at the quantity of the elements here. We see we see roofs. We actually see people at the window. Many people at the window we actually see beautiful vegetation, foliage covered with, uh, with gilding. I mean, this is a tour de force. In other words, uh, there was not one free inch. It was all meticulously, beautifully, skillfully carved. The only way to examine and appreciate you have to come here right right so we we really have a set of uh, uh two sets actually uh though different beds yes uh but will give us a great idea about uh 200 years ago how the predecessors our predecessors the chinese ancestors the rich one sorry <laughs> the rich one yes <laughs> yes how they actually fall asleep at night Yes. Because if we look at the bed, can we take a look at the bed again? The full thing. This is part of it. Uh, you, you look at the bed. This is something that happens on the outside of the bed, if we see that. That means yes. that it's the image that they will see when they are about to go to bed. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And uh, it would be the image you see when they get out of bed. Absolutely, yes. We are again. really talking about... Um, what a person sees before they go to sleep and what do you see when you actually wake up? Because, I mean, how long do you take to fall asleep, Mr. Pino? 
Uh, Take a seat, please. Yeah. <laughs> can I say, I actually sleep fairly fast. Yeah. I mean, I can't read as other people can. Box. Oops. Oh, oops. <laughs> we have to glue it. Uh, <laughs> have not, to. not a problem. Not, not a problem. Gentle, so, yeah. I in other words, I can go to bed uh, fairly easy and sleep within two, three minutes. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than that? Nothing more than that. Absolutely not. So, and uh, I have beautiful sleep, with the exception recently, as I mentioned, of being disturbed by these dreams. Other than that, I sleep very well. So the question is that um, when you fall, when you, if you take two or three minutes to fall asleep, and I suppose that uh, no one would stand outside the bed to prepare themselves to fall asleep, but actually you have, you spend so much amount uh, and dedication to actually prepare yourself uh, to go into bed, there must be a reason for it. And I suppose it's like, the idea is, what do you see before you fall asleep? And the, the immediate image you see right after you're awake, that might have been an important thing in the aspect of falling asleep. So the question is that, what do you bring into your dreams? I mean, if let's say, can we just put it in more simpler terms? Uh, if today, you... Uh, watch a horror movie before you fall asleep. Probably at night you'll be thinking about, you might not have a peaceful sleep, yeah. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we should be having uh, an evening and maybe before going to bed, uh, a complete relaxation. Maybe listen to music, have uh, a, a, a wonderful smell in, in the bedroom, and calm yourself down, especially if you've seen, as Mr. Khan has just uh, indicated, an horror movie. Detach yourself from uh, those scenes. Not easy, but at least you prepare yourself. So, the, with all this gold gilding, magnificent carving, um, when you go to sleep, it's like the last image you see before you fall asleep are gold, Magnificent sculptures, elephants, bats, lotus, as you mentioned. And the image that you also see when you wake up is the same image. I suppose that would actually be significant to the whole day. Yes. The, the, the eight hours that you fall asleep, you can't do anything much about it and then to, other than the implant images. Uh, but that will, I, I suppose that will serve as a great deal to the energy that we have. And... This is part of what the, the Chinese ancestors were thinking about. Yes. When they were thinking about, you know, let's have something to look at wonderfully. When I'm a bit drowsy, maybe I want to fall asleep. And do you know when you first wake up, it's very important. They actually say, when you first wake up, where, where do you charge your phone? Next to the bed? I no? do charge the phone next to the bed. Do you, once you wake up, do you look at the phone? Unfortunately, yes. You see, unfortunately, I do the same thing as well. So apparently, it's not a very good idea. It's not at all. So once we wake up nowadays, when we wake up, when we wake up, we will look at the phone and we'll start to, oh my God, messages, we'll start clearing because we think that we get it out of the way. But actually, uh, in the, 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 the ancients, what they do is that when they wake up, what they see is actually a scene of gold, a scene of imagination, a scene of magical appearances. Because as you mentioned, the many figures that are actually carved on the frames of the bed, they are you know, generals with swords, generals uh, who are winning victories and mystical elephants, auspicious bats and so on. So it would bring the person who just woke up to a different realm. It's a, it's a different world altogether. That means it will tell them that you know you are meant for greater things. Probably you can be a great general. Probably you can be a great scholar. And once they wake up, they are affirmed with their idea again and again. And don't forget, what we see today is that the goal is fading off. But 200 years ago, the goal was strong. Very strong. So can Correct. you imagine if you wake up, you don't, it's not sunlight that you see. It's, a, it's gold and glittering. So, oh, God. so that would be a, a different thing that, that you see. So... You ask yourself today, what are you bringing into your sleep and what are you waking up with? If you are bringing into sleep nightmares, you know, if you watch Netflix and you, you, you pursue sad Korean drama before you sleep, you might bring all these thoughts into your sleep. 
and it'll be part of you. <laughs> if you bring prosperous dreams into your sleep, prosperous ideas, that will be part of you. And the moment you wake up as well, are you bringing prosperous ideas into your life when you wake up? Are you bringing powerful ideas into your life when you wake up? You know, we talk about these Chinese artifacts that achieve this effect. We have been, for the last two episodes, talking about Tibetan rocks. Yes, we have. There is one category of the rocks or carpets that we talk about uh, that is actually meant for sleeping. Yes. And uh, we mentioned it, but we never got to the, the depth of it, that actually even the Tibetans, of course influenced by the Chinese, they would also believe in similar ideas. That a carpet that is for sleeping also achieves the same purpose. Am I right? You're absolutely right. If you think, possibly in the high altitude, 3,000 meters above uh, the sea level, where maybe there weren't that many artists, if there were at all, people would go to bed, they would sleep on a carpet, but the carpet would not be of one color. Right. They would have a carpet beautifully woven with motifs. Right. And those motifs, in my opinion, were inspirational for the day. So when you look at it, it really doesn't differ. In this case, we have uh, the feet of the bed, uh, inspirational. Why can you not become uh, a high-ranking general? Why can you not become uh, a better person than what you are? And the same thing would have happened, in my opinion, with the Tibetan. They would wake up where they were sleeping and they would be able immediately to see the design. Outside it was all, during the winter in particular, white, or it was very dark. And they would see a wonderful color, like the one, the two rugs that we are going to introduce tonight. It's a bit of a repetition, but very interesting with the concept of uh, sleeping. Right. So they're all interrelated, uh, the items uh, that tonight we, re we are proposing in this 45th uh, episode. Let's take a look at the carpets. You know, we know the Chinese, uh, they have this for the bed thing. It's like, you know, it, uh, I don't even have such a bed now. Uh, it's, nowadays, people's beds are very simple. It's super simple, minimalistic. You don't see anything. So you go to bed with nothing in mind. Hopefully, the okay, nothing my mind, mind is blank. <laughs> you don't implant any good ideas in your mind. You go minimalistic and you go, you know what? Your life is going to be minimalistic. Yes. But in the ancient Chinese, they are prosperous for so long. I think there's an absolute reason to it. We have Tibetan rocks with us. We, I know we have talked about this topic for a couple of weeks, but um, these two carpets we have not talked about before. We have not spoken it's, about these two carpets. Uh, these are kadans. These are yes, these are the, yes, Yeah, yes. I'm using this professional term of kadans. So there are the carpets that are for people to sleep on. Yes, to uh, sleep on. Long enough for a person to sleep on. And uh, if I show this, and you will know how amazing it actually is. Look at this. Long enough, and uh, if you can see, the image is magnificent. Is the image is just magnificent. Maybe we hold it uh, laterally, shall we? Look at this. It's long enough for sure for a person to sleep on. Uh, can you see what image it is? Oh, is it the other side? Yeah. See, when you fall asleep, you really realize that wow, what direction you're in. Yeah. But actually, you can sleep <laughs> either you side. Sleep either. As long as okay, when you for, get up, you for, recognize for them the to subject. See it, yeah. <laughs> For them to see it's a bit more obvious on which side it is, yeah. I mean, it's quite obvious. It's definitely not a snake. Uh, it's uh, one that we are familiar with, that this kadan, uh, a rug, actually. Huh? For, I, call, I, call, I call it rug, and yeah. the, the reason why I call it rug, but I don't know if I am correct, uh, the rug is usually smaller than what we consider a carpet. A carpet uh, is much, much bigger and that, than the rug. But this is my interpretation. I could be totally wrong, and please forgive me if I have made a mistake. But right. I like to call these rugs uh, rather than 
Cup. As I now. see, now Laura and Andy has actually like straight away mentioned that they see a dragon and they are correct. Absolutely correct. So Very good. You see, this is a dragon, this is a rock with dragon and this is for people to actually sleep on and lie, lie down actually. You know, lie right? down, even meditate. We, we, and meditate. So actually we have another one here. Yes. That uh, has a similar image. So it's not just one in a dozen, actually it happens uh, again and again. These are of several dragons, two dragons, I think. Two opposite dragons. Double dragon, yeah. And you will see we also have the two opposite uh, phoenixes. Oh, it's phoenix as well, yeah. These are phoenixes. So they are mythical animals. I think it's about also uh, yin and yang, if you wish. Beautifully rendered, very, very beautiful. What do they represent in a nutshell? Just rather than giving you so many details, uh, the dragon represents the emperor. The phoenix represents the empress, uh, a balance. Uh, look at the representation of the dragon, sinuous. Uh, look what the dragon has. It, it has four claws. Four claws. What is the dragon aiming to get? They're actually aiming at getting the flaming pearl. You see this round with the flames around? Right. Which is here. Yes. On both, on both sides. Extremely well rendered, not only in the depiction of the subjects, but also in terms of the color. Here we're talking about early 20th century. Look at the phoenixes. Look what they hold in their beaks, flowers. Right. Look, look at the beauty of their wings. Look at their plumage. They are flying as the dragon are also flying. And the idea that they're flying is very simple. It's all the number of clouds that are depicted in the field of this dragon. Right. What do we have in the center? In the center, we have a beautiful flower. And this is in the maroon color. The, the flower, in my opinion, in this case, sometimes with the Tibetan flowers, it's difficult really to pinpoint at what the flower is. But to me, this is a lotus. Uh, and it's a sign of purity and of beauty. Tendrils around. And uh, as you can possibly also see, the way the clouds have been depicted, uh, slightly smaller than the previous one, okay? I would say that the previous one with the single dragon, very unique, slightly longer, it would have possibly meant for a gentleman. At the same time, the colors, extremely, extremely beautiful. Imagine a lady sleeping on this uh, rug, getting up in the morning, and she gets the protection of the em emperor and the empresses. Uh, the beauty of the empress uh, is transferred uh, to her. How would she feel? A beautiful sleep during the night? In her own mind, she's flying. In her own mind, uh, she's inspired uh, by the day that is coming about or the evening before she goes to bed. And look at the utilitarian aspect. She is asleep on a woolen rug. We'll keep her warm. Which means that um, the Chinese, of course, as we mentioned, and the Tibetans with these uh, examples of these two rocks, one with double dragon and phoenix, the other one, that is uh, with one full dragon. One full dragon. Just imagine what, uh, that your sleep, when you go to sleep, the last image you see, last image you see, and at the moment, the first image you see when you wake up are dragons and phoenixes, generals that are winning victories, gold gilded victories, a gold gilded universe. Just imagine what kind of prosperity it will bring you and what kind of uh, imagination it will bring you uh, uh, if you have something like this. So the, th the thing nowadays in this today's world is that everything has been simplified. Everything is too nice and little, you know, you have the minimalistic concept. But look at what the people did in the past 
even the last eight hours of their everyday life, uh, when they go to sleep, they make sure that they'll bring something wonderful into their dreams. Am I wrong, Mr. Khan, to say that the people who have collected uh, Master Khan, uh, Master Yoon paintings, uh, they have actually the same effect? You're, you're right, because uh, we mentioned a great many times, and uh, many have asked us uh, where can they place Master Yoon's art. And uh, actually, one of the locations that people can place uh, Master Yoon's art, I, I intentionally put um, two cranes next to us. And uh, these two cranes have one similarity, is that they have been to UK, England. Yes. Um, it's because that uh, during uh, 25th of September, mm -hmm. which is the next Sunday, the host of Art Beyond Museum England edition, the MasterChef UK professional winner of 2021, Chef Daniel Lee, he's coming to Singapore. Oh, wonderful. And he'll be at the gallery. And uh, these are paintings that actually we can choose to actually put uh, in our bedroom. So while we can have all this elaborated, or maybe you can't, yeah. Maybe no one does that anymore. Uh, uh, maybe you can have a beautiful mattress or a rock thing and that's going on. Uh, but imagine when you lie down and you see Mastrin's painting right at the other end of your room and you fall asleep. And when you wake up, you see the same image. Uh, imagine it. Just what kind of prosperity and dreams you'll be bringing into your sleep. It's going to be full of prosperity, full of longevity, full of gold and full of silver. So it's the same idea that has happened in the past. That is exactly why the predecessors did it across culture from Chinese to Tibetan. And it's also the same thing that what will happen when you put Master Yun's feng shui painting in your bedroom. Just think about it when you fall asleep. And if somehow you can achieve that UV effect when you fall asleep, off the light, the UV effect slowly, slowly retreats as if bringing the dreams and prosperity and stars into your dreams. That's something. That's something really to, to, to think about. But what, what I've learned in, uh, in being here from you, Mr. Khan, is what the crane represents. And right. I really, really think not only prosperity, and this is something that I've learned, prosperity goes hand in hand with longevity. And when we think about the crane, in the past, it was said that the crane had to fly for a thousand years, a thousand years, in order to reach the sun. So the reiteration of this beautiful bird that flies and flies towards, uh, can I say it correctly, eternity? Yes. Eternity. And eternity together with prosperity, is the greatest gift that any human being can be provided uh, with. Right. So, if you're watching this episode tonight, I think um, one thing to take away is that... Several things to take away, sorry. Uh, don't look down on your sleep, or what you bring into your sleep. Yeah, it's not good to argue with your wife, or argue with your husband before you fall asleep. Because you might just bring the resentment into it, yeah. Solve that and uh, probably lay your eyes on something prosperous and beautiful before you go into it. Uh, best, if you have several of Master Yun's paintings, consider having one in the bedroom. So when, before you fall asleep, when you see it, it's as if when the predecessors, they were looking at these gorgeous gold sculptures, our Tibetan uh, ancestors, they were looking at these beautiful rocks before they close their eyes. And you might just bring the dragon and phoenix into your sleep. And the moment you wake up as well. And uh, probably that will determine how the quality of your day will go. And the whole efficiency, the whole productivity and everything, you might just wake up and be a better person. Because for the last eight hours when you're asleep, what you have been drinking about, drink, not drinking, what you've been dreaming about is dragons and phoenix, gold, victory, silver, and so on. So that should be, I, I, I think that should be the way of life. And I actually wonder, the people who have in their bedroom Master Yoon's art, huh? do they feel this? I, I actually have a client uh, who might be busy today, so he's not here, I can't ask him online, that uh, has seven of Master Currently six, the seven is uh, upcoming. Six of Master Yoon's uh, 
paintings and calligraphies yes. in his house. Three in the main hall. One outside the kitchen. Sorry, uh, let me count. Because there's six. Three in the main hall, one outside the kitchen, one at the one uh, one in the bed one in the bedroom. Right. And uh, I forgot where the other one went. That's terrible, yeah. So one in the bedroom for sure. What I know is that he just recently bought the seventh. So the seventh is gonna be in the main at the main door. Yes. So I'm sure it has done something for him. Because I suppose not just when he wakes up and when he falls asleep, he sees something prosperous and wonderful. It's when wherever he's in the house, he sees the same thing as well. So when you bring this kind of energy with you wherever you go, sleep, awake, you might just end up to be as prosperous and your longevity, and your prosperity might just be as longevity as, uh, as the queen. You said something that resonates with me at this very moment. Uh, it happens uh, that between uh, husband and wife, there's a little argument uh, at the end uh, of the evening. Uh, yep. Imagine if one of the two has the force, the determination, to point at Master Yoon's painting and say, darling, we are prosperous uh, because we have each other and we will live a long life that settles any tension. And the day after, who knows, maybe the other part would say the same words. We need to have a day that starts in a very positive note. And that will energize us like vitamins uh, and uh, propel us uh, to do our work or to do whatever we are called for during that day. Right. Okay. It's uh, so. <laughs> one must determine what they see before they fall asleep and uh, the, the first few phrases that you say to yourself when you wake up they're extremely important as well yes right uh, before you go for your supper before you go to sleep we are going to choose three winners from last week let's go ahead and, with it and while you do that I'm going to ask the question for last week as well. Yes. Okay, uh, I think we just keep it simple. Uh, yes. So that you have a great night's sleep and think of all the nice things and prosperity. We have two Tibetan rocks uh, just here. Yes. Right? Um, what is the common, what is the same symbol in them? Yeah? Uh, we talked about the Chinese uh, bait frames and the, the, the segments of Chinese bait frames. They have many symbols. A lot of auspiciousness, you know, when Chinese like to order fried rice, they order everything that's inside. But these two Tibetan rocks, they are meant for sleeping. What are the two com what, are th what is the one common symbol in between them? Yes. It's actually here, there's two of this symbol over here, and one of this symbol actually on the other one. So what is the common symbol that is on this Tibetan rock? Let us know. Yes, please. Put it in the comments, uh, because if you see this before you fall asleep, uh, and if you bring this into your dream, and if you wake up and you see this symbol, you might just end up like the, to be the stature and the capacity of this motif that we are talking about. Let's see what Mr. Pina has chosen. Amanda Ng, one of the Congratulations, Amanda. Good luck, uh, just prosperity now. and long life. And we have Yvonne Tan as well. Okay. Congratulations, Yvonne. Good and luck we and prosperity. Have... Vicky. <laughs> I just saw him a couple of days ago. All Vic the very Key best, well. Vic. Vic Key, Amanda Ng, and uh, Yvonne Tan. So once again, the question is that, what is the common symbol and motif, or ca carving, if you want to say, uh, in these two Tibetan rocks? Uh, it's something that we have not presented before. We have presented two weeks of Tibetan rocks, amazing things. Uh, but on these two, these symbols are just on these two. And please come and take a look. It's a different experience when you come, you touch them, and you see the details uh, that I've not been able, given also the time, to present to you in detail. Absolutely. Enjoy. Enjoy. Absolutely. So congratulations to the winners. Uh, next week, we continue to travel around the world yes. to look at different uh, artifacts, uh, which will give us a greater insight of Master Yuen's feng shui art world. Um, cheers. Cheers. Have a good evening. <laughs>